Welcome back to the Mott Miller YouTube channel, folks. Today, in this video, I'm making Rob stay true to a promise that he made me last year. Aren't I, Rob? James, I'm teaching you how to brew on a three-vessel system. I can't wait. So when I started home brewing, folks, I was brewing extract to begin with. Then I moved on to uh, brewing a bag. And then from there, I made the jump into using an all-in-one system, which is really popular for a lot of people, convenient, fits easily into family life, that kind of stuff. But Rob, when you started home brewing, things were a bit different, weren't they? Yeah, there wasn't a single vessel system that was available. So actually, I didn't start with extract kits. I started with actual malt extract and boiling it on various different saucepans on the hob in the kitchen. I used to have to do it twice so that I could get 20 litres into one fermenter and take over the whole kitchen and yeah it was great fun taught me a bunch about process and ingredients and what did you do next after the whole extract move where was your next step i stayed brewing in the kitchen um which was a disaster zone <laughs> however i did move into having a purpose boiler yeah which was a burko nappy boiler but okay actually yeah. perfect for the perfect for the job so i was using that single vessel to uh, boil up malt extract, basically. Okay. Then I purchased a second one, which was a eBay. eBay was perfect for that sort of thing back then. Uh, purchased a second one, and I made myself a mash tun out of a picnic cooler. Where did you go after that when you decided that that just wasn't going to be uh, practical in the long term? I built an awesome brew shed in the garden. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, so that took me out of the kitchen, which made a whole brew day a much more relaxed affair. Yep. And this is more or less the system that I started with. And it's a basically the most basic three vessel system that you can that you can have no automation at all. Everything's manual. At the time I was brewing on gas yep. rather than electric, which is what we've got here. So in a way it was actually even more difficult. You're balancing gas flames. Yeah, that, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where I, that's where I started. So I imagine, Rob, you must have learned quite a lot throughout that early period brewing, right? And then moving into this opened up the avenue for you to learn even more about the brewing process techniques and, you know, options that you have as a brewer. Sure, because, because this really basic system, there are some limitations to it. You have to work your way around problems that arise on a brew day. Yeah. So you have to work it out yourself. There's no, there was no one there telling me. So that was kind of a really good way of educating myself on how to overcome problems that are gonna inevitably occur on a brew day. It's actually a cracking way to start brewing. So this system we've got in front of us right now, talk me through um, what we've got going on, the components, the different kettles, what the function is here. Okay, so we've got a 50 litre hot liquor ton. Okay, yeah. With a two kilowatt electric element in it. That is connected to a pump. Yeah. All right. Which then pumps liquor from there into our 50 litre mash tun. This is an uninsulated mash tun. It's as simple as they come. It's just got a false bottom in it. Later in the process, we will be able to recirculate the wort through the mash. Yeah. Okay. Um, which, which is a really nice thing to do. It, you end up with crystal clear mash liquor, which is really nice. We can then transfer using the pump from the mash tun to the boil kettle. Again, a two kilowatt element in here. And you'll notice that this is a smaller vessel. When we're brewing on three vessel systems, the biggest vessel is ideally your hot liquor ton. Yeah. Ideal because we can do a, we can add the complete volume of liquor that we're gonna need for the entire brew. Makes it really easy for our water treatment. Uh, it just right, goes okay. in one go. Yeah, fab. So once we have transferred our work into the boil kettle, we're then gonna sparge again from here to here. Yeah. Right, I said this is the most simple system we're setting up. We've got one pump. Yeah. All right, so three vessels. Uh, we are doing what you call batch sparging. Right, so okay. So because we can't transfer from the hot liquor ton to the mash ton at the same time as transferring from the mash ton to the kettle, because that would require two pumps. Yeah. We've only got one pump. So we're going to do what we call batch sparging. It was massively popular in the States, and it's actually... Um, I ended up with two pumps in the end, but when I started, one pump batch sparging. It's really simple. Fair. We'll talk you through the process of exactly how to do that a little bit later on. 
And on this system, what's the kind of capacity that I could end up with at the end of my brew day? How much work may I end up with? We are brewing a 23 litre brew today. The boil kettle here is your limiting factor in this particular setup because it's a 35 litre kettle. Right, okay. Realistically, if we had a 50 litre kettle, we would be able to extend the brew length because there's stacks of room inside the mash, inside tun, the yeah. mash tun. This is the most fantastic thing about it. It's completely modular. So when I want to make an upgrade, it's not show, shelve the whole system and start again. All of these components can be used again. Cool. We can even transfer some of the components that are on this kettle to a different kettle. Yes. So we can change what was our mash tun. We could turn into a repurpose as a hot liquor tun or a Herms vessel. It, it, it's, it's endless. I'm loving the fact that this feels so much more hands on, Rob. I mean, I'm used to um, brewing on an all in one system where it's app controlled. You know, there's an element of it telling me what to do. Yeah. Right. Um, there's none of that here, is there? No, it's a polar opposite. All right, and that's why it's going to teach us so much. You actually have to do the calculations here. Um, so the amount of water that we started off with, it, that, it wasn't an app that told us that. We've actually had to do those calculations. Yep. I'm getting really enthusiastic about getting on with this now, and we haven't even touched on the recipe. Rob, what are we brewing today? I've always loved that Twisted Stout recipe that I came up with some time ago now yeah I've, I've drank that beer before it is fantastic and hey. you do you love it yeah i do i absolutely love it and i've wanted to make an imperial version of it okay. for some time so this video is going to be a little bit different to what we normally shoot okay because i've been thinking about this and i want to document this for myself and for the viewers at home so what i'm going to do is go and grab the camera and we're going to go kind of rogue roaming with the camera um, i'm going to uh, kind of be first person whilst you're talking me through the process and we can see every single step of the way so that well for me i can look back on it uh, in the future and hopefully try and repeat some of this what's our first step then rob okay our first step is to look at our recipe and run it through some of the calculators that we've got on our website yep. because we are going to need to know what the total volume of liquor is for our complete brew because that goes into our hot liquor ton okay now that calculator actually gives us a little bit more information if we do things like add the temperature of the grain in there it tells us what temperature we need to the hot liquor to be at so that it's the right strike temperature so that we get the right mash temperature for okay. our mash tun. Yeah, because when we add the grain, the temperature of the mash will come down. Yeah, it will. And obviously, this is also important. So we've got a volume of stainless steel here at a low temperature. Um, that will take temperature away from the strike water as well. Now, what I've done is actually put a couple of kettlefuls of boiling water into the mash tun, left the lid on. That's been in there for 10 minutes. I've now got rid of that water out because I don't want it in there. Yeah. Um, but I've used it to preheat this stainless steel. Yeah. So the amount actually the, of temperature that's going to be taken away from our strike water is less than it would be if this was freezing cold. Cool. Right. I'm with you. This is part of the repeatability of the system. You know, if this is out in your shed and it's in the winter, you know, you're going to need to take that into account. Yeah. So my calculator told me that I need basically 43 litres of water in total for the whole, for uh -huh, the whole brew. Yeah. So we've got that in here. And it also told me that that water needs to be at about 78 degrees so that we hit our 68 degree mash temperature when we go in. Yeah, OK. Now, again, this is about the most basic system that we can put together. The mash tun is not insulated. So we know that we're going to lose some temperature over the period of the mash. I'm not looking for an exact brew here. What we're doing is we're making this beer as a learning experience, but we're going to make notes on everything. So we are going to say, right, OK, we doed in with the strike water at 77. It resulted in the mash temperature of 68. And over a period of an hour, it dropped down to 66. Yep. All those notes are going to be massively important for us moving forward. Now it's time to get our grains in the mash tun. And like you said, we've not got any water in there at the moment. It's just a little bit damp from where you heated it up exactly. previously. Exactly that. And we're not going to take any care about this, actually, because there's no point. 
Um, normally, if we were brewing on a single vessel system, you know, we'd be gently, we'd be gently doing in. Okay. We're not going to do that. And so this method that we're using today, Rob, um, you said it's called underletting, yeah? Yeah, underletting, and actually uh, quite common in commercial breweries. And so the premise is we're going to be adding the grain and then pumping the correct amount of hot liquor underneath the grain. Exactly. Um, and then it absorbs it. So we have to do that nice and slowly. Yeah, actually, a, a lot of this is where the, some of the learning comes in. You know, we want to do this slowly. We don't we don't want to be whacking valves open really quickly and closing them really quickly because it all has an effect on the on the brewing process. So everything we're doing is going to be done nice and gently today. Um, we can just put some uh, salts in for a water treatment here as well. We've got about eight, eight point two kilos of grain here. Okay, so a reasonable amount. Yeah. Pop our lid on. So now we're ready to actually turn the pump on and start pumping our hot liquor into our mash tun. Cool. I'm actually also going to, at this point, I've had the element on here to get it up to temperature. I'm going to turn the element off. Remember, this is completely manual control. So we're balancing, turning the element on with temperatures. Again, it teaches you so much. You know, I, I've turned that element off now, but I know that the temperature in here is going to carry on increasing because uh -huh. you get the latent heat. Yep. So when using a magnetic pump, I'm using clear silicon tubing here, which actually helps me out a great deal because magnetic pumps are notoriously difficult to keep the air out. You know, they cavitate with an air bubble. So I know from experience that I need to open the valve on the delivery vessel. I need to open that first. I then need to open the valve on the vessel that is receiving the liquid I can open them both and then I can flick my pump on and I can actually see that there's no air bubbles in there whatsoever at this point I'm then going to slow the pump down because as we said I want to do it nice and gently I'm yep. going to slow the pump down using the ball valve on the mash tun. So is that all of our um, liquor moved over now, Rob, for the mash? Yeah, about 22 litres in there. We've underlet that. And you can just see it. it's just starting to rise to the surface. I'm just going to leave it for a little while longer just so that it absorbs as much liquor as possible. That avoids any sort of dough balls and makes it way easier to dough in and also gives us a, the most amount of efficiency. We don't want dough balls. So we've doughed in, um, which really interesting to see the method that um, you were using to underlet the uh, the liquor works really well. Yeah, it does. Um, one thing we did run into immediately was actually some uh, some challenges with getting to our correct mash temperature. Yeah, sure. Our temperatures were out, so we had to use two kettles of boiling water actually to get our mash temperature correct. Actually, the, the good thing is that we were under. Yeah. Not over. Over is a much bigger issue because we run the risk of denaturing enzymes and, and, and all sorts. So we don't want to go over, but under is much easier to deal with. A couple of kettlefuls of boiling water. A quick recirc using the, or gentle recirc, using the pump, and we're up to our mash temperature. Lid's going to go on, and we're going to hold that for about three quarters of an hour before we start recirculating again. Awesome. Let's just take a quick look inside. And I have to say, it's smelling rather lovely in here. Right, Rob, I heard your phone alarm going off, which must mean we've reached the end of the uh, mash time. Uh, what are we doing next? We are going to recirculate the mash for 10 minutes or so before transferring the mash liquor that's in the mash tun at the moment into the kettle. Yeah, so okay. Let's, let's get cracking. So this is where the uh, return, the silicon tube return comes in handy. It's just going to sit on top of what is, in effect, the grain bed. I'm going to open the bottom valve up completely. Yep. When I'm controlling a magnetic pump, I want maximum flow into the pump, and I'm controlling the magnetic pump with the outlet, not yep. the inlet. So I don't want to starve the pump. It's important that we open the, the delivering valve first, as we said earlier on in the video. I'm going to flick the pump on now. 
Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. Okay, now now I can control it because I don't want it to... Uh, I just want this to be a slow process. I don't want this to be... Remember what we said earlier in the video about doing things slowly? Yeah, you taking know, if you, our time. If, yeah, if you whack it on, it kind of jolts the system. It can cause stuck mashes and all sorts. We just want to, we just want a gentle, if you look at the flow rate there, we just want a gentle flow rate. Yeah, I see and that. Actually, yeah. this is really interesting because this, this can teach you a lot. So you can see air bubbles in the, now that's come from, I guarantee those air bubbles are coming from this section not being tight. Now I'm not going to worry about those air bubbles. Um, if we were doing, if we were really worried about low oxygen brewing, then this would be like panic stations. So Rob, you wanted to talk to us about one thing we can do throughout the entire brewing process to kind of see how we're getting on with our goals, right? Yeah, sure. Actually, it's really important for me that we test the, the beer that we're producing, the beer end product that we're producing right from the very start. I want to do as much testing on it as I can because I want to learn about the process as much as I can. Yeah. So I want to be tasting it and I want to be measuring gravity, see how much sugar we got in the work, whether we're on the right track yep. to come out with the product that we were aiming to come out with. Okay, Or fine. how far away from it we are. And possibly at this stage, if something isn't correct or it isn't on target, we can make adjustments now to, uh, to get it back on track. And we can take a gravity reading really easily using a uh, refractometer. We just, need a, we just need literally a couple of drops of... Um, a couple of drops of work. We put it on there, like that. Flick the lid closed. Just wait for a little second for the uh, the temperature to be corrected. And then we hold it at the light and we can take a read in. And I can actually see that that's at 1078. Um, so we are really on track for, for where we want to be, which is great. So we've been recirculating the work within the mash tun for about 10 minutes. It's actually, although it's a jet black work in here, we can see it's actually now crystal clear, um, which is really nice to see. So we now need to empty this into our boil kettle, which we're going to do using the pump. So we just need to transfer some hoses around. So I'll knock this bottom one off first, then I'll turn the top one off. Then I'm going to turn the pump off. I'm then going to disconnect this one. And so we've got cam lock fittings on this system, right? Yeah, only on the vessel side. I haven't got cam locks on the pump because actually when we're using one pump, we are not, we're not needing to take hoses off the pump. They can just stay, they, they can just stay where they are. Right, okay, I'll get you. Um, I'm actually going to undo this, but I'm going to get a glass here because we're going to get some some spillage. I just want to catch the drips. The more drips, the cleaner we can brew, the better. So that's now going into the bottom of the boil kettle. Yeah, yeah that's it. Into the bottom of the boil kettle. So again, I want to open my delivery valve first. I'm then going to open my receiving valve. Right, you can see it's now a bit of a trickle going in. We're just going to open that up a little bit. I don't want it to be, I don't want to draw the wort out of the mash tun really, really quickly because we don't want to stick that mash. Yeah, okay. All right, it's nice and fluid, but we don't want the chance of sticking. Now, importantly, actually, when we get to this stage, as soon as that element's covered, I can then turn it on. Okay, right, so we can start heating yeah. what's in there up yeah. towards a boil. Exactly that. So the work's transferred from the mash tun over into the boil kettle. Yeah, we've actually completely emptied that. Yeah, um, so what's next? Right, okay, we are going to, we're going to repeat the process. Okay. So we're going to transfer the rest of the liquor that's in our hot liquor tun. Yeah. And we're going to put it on top or into the mash tun. Yeah. We're then going to give it a really good stir. We're then going to recirc again so that we clear it back down before trans transferring it over into the boil kettle yeah at which point we will have our pre-boil volume okay in our kettle so this is the batch barge method right yeah, exactly and actually some recipes call for or you can you can do one batch you can do two batches yep. some people would top up the mash tun um 
top up the mash tun before they empty it. Yep. There's various different ways of doing this. There's no right or wrong way. It's down to uh, user discretion. Cool. So we need to transfer some. Uh, we need to transfer some tubing about. Yeah. So we're going to take our delivery hose, which we now want to be. So this, is, this is where the benefit of these cam locks come into play, right? They're super yeah, this quick is, and easy. This is absolutely super quick and easy. And if you were doing hose barbs, you know, you're having to pull, pull um, silicon tubing off of hose barbs. It's possible. You can do it. Um, if you can't afford to go the cam lock route straight away, but it's definitely easier for the cam locks. If, if you're on hoses that are being moved about, if the hoses are static, then, uh, then it's really not necessary. Okay, and, and actually you're... having a, a vessel so you can collect any drips because inevitably there are going to be some, but you just want to keep your brewing area as clean as possible. I notice you're putting the um, in for the sparge water at the top of the, uh, the vessel, not underneath, which is different to how we obviously started the mashing process. Exactly that, Jim. So we, we are now we're talking about rinsing grains rather than uh, rather than making sure that they're all completely soaked with the mash liquor. Yeah. So I am turning on both the valves. I don't have to worry about, um, I can do it quite quickly, this one, yep. because I'm, I'm, nothing's going to stick in it. It's just plain water. Actually really shows you where air, air bubbles, when you're using this uh, transparent tubing, really shows you where air bubbles. And if you find, if you get an air bubble, if you squeeze the tube, you can get rid of it. Okay, so it sort of pushes it further. Yeah, you got it. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it actually teaches you whereabouts you're going to get airlocks in the yeah. system and how to get rid of them. Right, so that all of our liquor has now been moved over into the mash tun. And I'm going to give it a real nice stir because I want to release absolutely as much of this sugar as possible. Those people that are used to doing uh, fly sparging, you know, absolutely having a heart attack at the moment because, <laughs> because, you know, all of that work that I did to set this grain bed, I'm now completely and utterly wrecking um, by uh, giving it a good old stir. But trust me, this really does work. And I can, I've got the ability to transfer this, transfer this work that's uh, in here over and over and over and over again until we've got clear run-ins and then straight into the, into the kettle. And that, it doesn't take long for it to clear down again. Yeah. So I've just transferred my ho hoses over. So I now set up to do a recirculation of the mash tun. So again, turn my delivery hose on. I'm just gonna turn the pump on. And then I'm gonna throttle it right back because I don't want to, I'm gonna throttle it right back because I don't want to pull that mash to stick. I'm gonna let that clear for about 10 minutes or so before we transfer it over, we're just gonna make sure it's running nice and clear. I'm also gonna do a, uh, a second reading of what the gravity is in here before transferring it over to the kettle. Then I'll do a final gravity reading of our pre-boil pre -boil gravity from the kettle uh, so that I know that we're completely on track. Okay, so we've been recirculating for about 10 minutes and you can see now, if I put that on the side there, the wort's really nice and clear. So does that mean we're now in a position where we could look at transferring from the mash tun back over into the um, into yeah. the boil kettle? Yeah, yeah, ten minutes, fifteen minutes is absolutely fine. So we're now straight back over into the into the kettle. So reverse again. Um, we want to turn off our pump, and instead of coming out of the bottom of the mash tun back into the top of the mash tun, we're going to come out of the bottom of the mash tun into the bottom of the kettle. Right, so it's just the one cam lock we have to move around this time. Exactly that. And always, so, because it's so easy to like leave a tap on. I've done it before where I've left this top tap on um, and you get a siphon action. Okay. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> it, yeah, before you know it. It's really easy to just forget what you're doing. So it's like full concentration. Obviously what we're dealing with here is relatively hot as well. We don't want any accidents. Turn that on, turn that on, turn our pump on and 
gently shut that one again because I don't want to... Don't want to throw it in too quickly, no? No. Right, okay, so the element um, you've just switched back on in this kettle, right, Rob? Yeah, I'd actually had to turn the element off in this kettle because it was coming up to boil quicker than we were able to get this to clear down in the mash tun. So it's actually like 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, it was coming to the boil. I don't want this to boil and then add more cooler liquid back into it because two hot breaks and I don't want to mess around with that. Yeah, cool. So we're at 80 degrees. We've got a rather full kettle. As you can see, I don't want any boil overs in here. Actually, we're going to put the hops in at this point. They make a massive difference. It takes that surface tension away, which is what we're suffering with at the moment. And it makes a boil over much, much less likely. Yeah, I mean, looking at the, the top of that, it looks like an espresso, doesn't it? Like yeah. a massive espresso. Yeah, we've actually tasted it as well. And it tastes absolutely stunning. So, <laughs> yeah, but let's get, the, um, let's get the hops in. So we've got 100 grams of uh, Mandarin and Bavaria. They're going in right away. It's actually such a nice hop. Yeah, that kind of orangey tangerine thing that it brings. It's just stunning, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And actually, I'll swap these out as well. So the original recipe, the Twisted Stout uses Bramling Cross. And I think this would be really nice using Bramling Cross as well. But I just think uh, these are slightly more punchy. And it will stand up just a little bit more. I don't want it... Obviously, it's an Imperial Stout. I don't want it to be a hoppy beer. But I do want there to be some flavour um reminiscent of the of the hop and i think that this uh, mandarin and bavaria will actually suit it better at this higher strength one thing that we do need to look at is we're only using a single pump yeah of course so we have used that pump to obviously transfer from our hot just water or liquor from our hot liquor ton but we've also used it to transfer unboiled wort yeah from our mash ton to our kettle now we can use the boiling or very near boiling were in the kettle when we come to the end of the boil to sanitize our pump. One thing about magnetic pumps is they hate pumping boiling liquids. Yeah. So to get a decent flow of boiling liquid, whilst, whilst the kettle's actually boiling, to get a decent flow out of that tap and then back in is really, really difficult. The pumps don't like it at all. And I want to make sure that the pump is actually not sanitized but I want to make sure the pump is clean of any of that unboiled work. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to top up a small amount of water in our hot liquor ton, uh -huh. just so that the element's covered. Yeah. That will probably be about 10 litres or so. We're going to heat that water up and then we're going to use our pump to recirculate it through just so that it cleans out the... All of the moving all parts of the and the hose. And the, yeah. yeah, exactly all of that. We can then use this water in here that we've heated up to clean out the mash tun yeah once it's been dug out which is obviously your duty thank you very much james okay i'll crack on digging out then i can see we are venturing ever closer to a boil which is <laughs> yeah, always yeah. a good thing to see right we've got a uh, yeah yeah it's great it's coming to the boil however i'm just uh even though we've got our first work hops in there they'll be breaking out surface tension as soon as possible we still stood up we're on standby with a um, with a spray gun. Yeah. So I can just uh, dampen it down if it looks like it's going to leap out the top of the pot. Because when it does, it is an almighty mess to clear up. And uh, and yeah. you've already done enough of that with digging out the mash tun. Yeah. So. Nobody wants a boil over no, as well, no, do they? Right. No. So Rob, we didn't have a boil over, which was uh, very well judged by you. Uh, you are far more experienced with this yeah. than me because I was definitely freaking out a little bit. <laughs> uh, where where are we at now? We are. It's just a rolling boil now. Okay. So we've set our 90 minute timer. We're going to do protoflock and yeast nutrient 10 minutes before the end of the boil. That needs sorting. Actually, at the same point, we are going to use an immersion chiller actually on this. We're keeping it really, really simple. Yep. So stainless steel immersion chiller, that's going in. Also about 10 minutes before the end of the boil. And then once the boil is finished, we are going to be doing a whirlpool with the immersion chiller in. So the wort's going to be moving around the chiller to make that absolutely as efficient as possible. Cool. Have we got any more hops to go in as well? Yeah, there's a five minute addition. Cool. There's a five minute addition. Same again, Mandarina Bavaria. We've hit the end of the boil. I heard your phone alarm go off again. Um, what's our next couple of steps? We are now at the end of the boil. So I'm going to flick the element off. We've had our chiller in 
so that it is sanitizing in yeah. the hot work. We've done the protoflock, we've done the yeast nutrient. We are now, now the boil stopped with our cleaned but not sanitized pump and hoses. I'm just going to connect those back up again because we're going to do a, a whirlpool um, whilst we are chilling. And actually this, it makes the chiller massively more efficient if we can have the work moving round over the surface of the chiller. Yeah. So we're going to connect that up now. Um, so we're creating a whirlpool. So on the inside of the kettle, I've got a a pickup tube that's on the on the very edge of the kettle and it's got a hose barb on it that's pointing in the opposite direction of the hose barb that's on my whirlpool return so we're going to create a nice a nice whirlpool in fact let me put that that way is that nicely set up let's move that across there Remember, delivery hose open first. Receiving hose opened next. I want to try and put the pump on without any air locks. So now we need to turn the water on for the chiller. Yeah. Which I'm just going to reach down and do. And these chiller coils like this, these immersion chillers, actually they're really efficient, aren't they, when you're doing this whole flow past them and um, moving them around, right? Yeah, absolutely, they really are. There's a few things that you need to be um, aware of and that we've spoke about in previous videos. So if there is any water left, remaining water left in this chiller, when you put that in your boiling work, it superheats and it squirts really like boiling hot water out and you don't want that squirting anywhere near you. Yeah. So, um, and actually, they can, they can hold quite a lot. You think they're empty, and they're not, and that definitely can happen. Yeah. So, making sure that the connections are all pointing away from yeah, you. Exactly that. When you add it into the kettle, right? Um, also, you can see that the whirlpool attachment that I've got on here, actually, try not to burn myself, but you can see that it's underneath the surface of the work. Look. Yeah. Because what I don't want to do is introduce a load of oxygen at this stage while it's still hot. Yeah. So we're going to now leave that alone completely. There's nothing we can do. It's just going to it's just going to chill down. We want to get this down to about 20 degrees, which is our pitching, yeast pitching temperature. Yeah. And you can see it's coming down really quickly as well. Yeah. Well, there's a few things to be said about that. These are obviously the most efficient when the wort is hottest and they are most efficient when the groundwater temperature is as low as possible. So we are right at the very start of April now here in the UK and the groundwater temperatures are really, really low temperature. So these are really super efficient. Yeah. And we've got a fast flow rate as well going through it, which we can adjust with the uh, tap going, pumping the cold water through as well. Yeah, exactly that. We don't want to be, um, we don't want to be wasting water so we can adjust the, adjust the flow so it's picking up the right amount of heat from the work. I'm really impressed at how quickly this method that you've just shown me has reduced the temperature in the kettle down to pitching temperature. We're already at 20 degrees and ready yeah. to transfer, right? So we've got 20, 25 litres of now wort in here at, at, at 20 degrees. So we can transfer that to the, to the fermenter. And um, one thing that needs to be said though is these chillers it does depend on the size of the kettle. So yeah. they're, they're only really any good up to, I should imagine 50 liters is about the maximum. Once you get start getting past that, it doesn't matter what size chiller you put in there, you, you're really gonna struggle. And that's when some other form of chiller is gonna be far better. So a plate chiller. Yeah. Um, counterflow, something like that. Any type of counterflow yeah. chiller is gonna be better, which yeah. is why breweries use them. Yeah, cool, okay. So what's our next steps then? Are we gonna um, use the pump to pump our work into the fermenter? This bit's really important. We've just spent the last 10 minutes whirlpooling this work. The last thing that we want to do is dis disturb the cone of tube and hops that are gonna okay. be at the bottom there. Right, so it's it takes a surprising amount of time for this work to stop moving in the kettle. 
and we don't want to start transferring it until the whole volume of this work has completely settled. Okay. So remember at the start of the video, I said that you can't, you know, some things you just can't rush, right? We just need to stick the lid back on this. Yeah. And we need to come back in about 15 minutes time. Yeah. And then we need to just gently take it out of the bottom of the kettle into the fermenter. And not use the pump, just literally use the tap to drain, drain it in. Okay. It depends on the size of the vessel. Right. Okay. Because using the pump on a 35 litre kettle is the kettle's too small for the for how vicious the pump is. Uh, okay, right? it's gonna, so, when it draws it out, it's going to draw it out too quickly, along with all the tube and everything that we've we've it, gathered. Exactly that. If it was a 70 litre kettle, bosh, I'd be I'd be using the pump because I yeah. know that that tube cone is is a distance away. But when it when you're using this size kettle, I'm just going to do it under gravity. Okay, cool. Right. Well, I guess come back in a few minutes once we've uh, had a chance to let it settle down. Awesome. Let's do that. That's it. The work has stopped moving in the kettle. We know that yeah. our whole volume is settled. So we know that in the middle of this kettle, there's going to be a almost like a cone of trube and hop debris, which we'll see once the kettle starts to completely empty. Look at it. It's like molasses, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Yeah, it it's, looks it's a real dark one. Absolutely stunning. Yeah. Like actually, and the whole way through the smell of the boat, it's been really, it's been a delightful brew. Yeah. So all we need to do is now get the wort into our fermenter. Okay. Which is just here. And actually, you might notice that, um, or not seen this fermenter before, we, this has been on trial with us for the last little while. We've put a whole load of brews through it. It's been absolutely fantastic. And this is going to be a stocked product over the next little while. See the link down below. Let's get the wort into the fermenter. Yeah, and we've cleaned and sanitized this. It's all ready to go. Yeah. And we're just going via gravity, yeah? Yeah, we are, actually. And I might need your help. Okay. So what I'm going to do is taps off. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take that off there like that. Actually, these um, cam locks are really handy because they've got the little, uh, on the arms, they've got the... The O-rings, oh, yeah. and yeah, you can yeah. use it to connect. It's really handy, except at this point, it's a bit more difficult. Right, so if you can see that, I want it. I want to splash at this point. Yeah. So we're going to splash as much as possible. Yeah, because the name of the game now is getting oxygen into this work, right? So that the yeast has got what it needs to do the job. Exactly that. And just while that's happening, I am going to take this one off as well. I'm going to use a bit of gravity to empty as much out of this pump as possible. Well, we've got 25 litres of wort in our fermenter, looking absolutely glorious. Um, I can't wait to see how this beer is going to turn out. But before we go too far, how are we fermenting it? We are using a Brew Labs yeast slope. Okay. So the Burton upon Trent, which actually suits this style. I think it's going to be fantastic in this style of beer. Cool. Um, so I see we've got a conical flask down there. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we've got a litre of starter in there. Yeah, we have. So we're going to swirl that round and we're going to pitch the whole amount. Fantastic. And this actually, we started off the, we actually started off the, the slope a little late. So we've not actually done it completely as per instructions. So we've got a whole litre starter here and it's basically at High Krausen. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to go in there. Now we can argue whether this is exactly the right thing to do or not. However, this is the way that we're playing it. So I'm going to swirl it around because I want all that yeast from the bottom in. And I need to be a little bit careful because I've got in here a stir bar. Yeah, don't want to be getting that in. Not really, no. I don't want to be getting that in, but I do want to be getting all the yeast. So uh, I'm just going to stop there because I want to get that. I'm going to try and leave the stir bar behind, but I can't see it through the Krausen. There he is. Boom, that's my job done there. Awesome. Right, we're going to need a blow off, James. Okay. And look, uh, what's awesome about this fermenter, we've got a chiller coil in there. Yeah, with a long thermo well. Yeah. So actually, we're going to connect this up to a grandfather glycol chiller, 
with the GCA kit. Oh, okay, yeah. So we are gonna have a heater on here. We're also gonna have chilling, and it's also wireless. Excellent. So we can monitor it from wherever we want. We can turn it up and down wirelessly. Yeah, and as, I, as you've already said, we've got a blow off fitted there, yeah, which, which I'm just we're gonna, gonna hook up. Uh, I'm gonna hook that up to a bottle of Star San. Should be good. First three vessel brew day. What do you think? Well, absolutely epic brew day. <laughs> yeah. um, I, look, there's elements of it that took me right back to when I started all grain brewing, um, when I was doing uh, brewing the bag, that kind of stuff. Um, it is a complete departure to how I brew now, which is like I've already said on an automated system that does much of this for me. What I absolutely love though is actually how involved you are, yeah, yeah. how much control you've got, how much thinking you have to do, you know, you're, you, something goes not quite right, well, how can I correct it or adapt because of that? It's been fantastic, Rob. Thank you very much for showing me the ropes. No worries, it's been really good fun. And that is the about the most basic way that you can do it. So you've not, you talk about control, They're, you know, it's all manual control and, and you can definitely m make mistakes along the way. We made mistakes so our mash temperature didn't end up exactly where we want it. Do you know what? We've ended up with about the right amount of beer in the fermenter at about the right starting gravity. We're delighted because we've made beer. It's not going to be a competition entering beer or anything like that. It's just well, we don't know yet. It might be. <laughs> the, aim of the, the aim at the start of the day was to get a keg full of imperial stout and and that's that's what we're going to end up with yeah and that's absolutely great you know we've brewed together and we've learned quite a lot during the way yeah I, th I could see this being something that you know if you and your buddies you know maybe get together you do this together collectively because each person could be doing slightly different bits throughout the day but equally you could go and do this by yourself yeah, yeah. you know and really throw yourself invest yourself into a whole day um brewing in this way it's been fantastic um so next steps is we've got the three vessel system set up. We can now just add to it. Yeah. So next we can do a herb set up so that we can control that mash temperature nicely. Yeah. We can get some uh, volume markings in the, in the kettle so that uh, we know exactly the volumes of liquor that we're transferring. We just make gentle steps yeah. to make this the like the fantastic three vessel system. We just do it gently. What I'd really like to see as well is actually the system we've got here, taking it to the next size in terms of capacity as well. Yeah. So whether that's adding a 50 litre kettle for boiling or moving our two 50 litre kettles around and having a 70 litre HLT. Yeah. So that actually we then, uh, we're bringing in a bigger HLT so we can do um, much bigger volume batches at the end of it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and all that's all really easily done. We hope you've enjoyed this video as much as we've enjoyed brewing today and showing you exactly what goes into brewing beer on a three vessel system. It's been eye opening for me. Now, if you have enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to our channel. It really helps us out. Give us a thumbs up as well. Hit the bell for notifications so you can stay up to date with everything we're doing here at Mont Miller HQ. Sign up to our newsletter, which there's a link in the uh, description below. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And I think all that remains to say is thank you very much and have a great break. Cheers.